My voice is, is a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also inspiration, you know, loving James Baldwin, loving Toni Morrison, loving, so a lot of inspiration. So, but I would just say cultivate. And for me, that's then living a very bold and colorful and cultural life. Because I think that's the thing sometimes that like people forget to do is live. Um, and then you see it in their work, right? It What's going on, y'all? It's Vanessa Darby, Randy C. Bonds, and Javi, and we are The Entourage. First and foremost, before we even get into today's episode, <laughs> we want to thank you all so, so, so much. We got some new subscribers over on the YouTube channel. We got new listeners over on the podcast, and we see y'all. We hear y'all. We love y'all. <laughs> thank you so much for rocking with us. We really appreciate it, and we're going to keep it going. We're on season five right now, and we have a heavy lineup for season five. Thank you to our guests to con for continuing to say yes <laughs> to our podcast podcast requests we love hearing your stories and if you like listening to the stories let us know because it does help us as we continue to pitch for guests if there's somebody you want to see on the show let us know email us at the entourage podcast at gmail.com we would love to take those into consideration today under the spotlight we have felicia pride who is a tv writer and producer she has written on every duvernay's queen sugar she is currently one of the producers on gray's anatomy and she's going to talk about a lot of her receipts but her story and how she got here. We have been waiting for this interview. We're so excited to bring it to y'all. Let's go ahead and jump under the spotlight today with Felicia Pride and Randy C. Bonds on the Entourage Podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in to another episode of the Entourage Podcast. Today, we are highlighting Felicia Pride, an amazing filmmaker, writer, uh, producer. You have um, seen her work with Shonda Rhimes on Grey's Anatomy, um, so many other places. And I'm excited for her to share her work and share what she's done, what she's doing, how she's gotten into this industry, and just the, the, um, the mark that she hopes to leave through the work that she does. Um, so I'm excited to have her here with the entourage today. Felicia, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me and for this platform to talk to creators. Yes, definitely. We appreciate it. We have a lot of aspiring creators. We have a lot of active creators and people who are inspired just by the journeys of people like yourselves who are currently doing what they are either trying to do or hope to someday do. Um, and so the, the knowledge that you shared here definitely doesn't go unnoticed. It doesn't fall on deaf ears. People love to pick up the gems and use them as they see fit for themselves. So thank you for being willing to share your story and um, to, to make an appearance on our platform. For those who don't know who you are, you know, who don't even know what you do, tell us who Felicia Pride is. Um, I am a TV writer, TV and film writer and producer. Um, I moved to LA seven years ago at the age of 35 uh, with one script. That script became Really Love, which is uh, streaming on Netflix currently. I right now am a producer on Grey's Anatomy, um, and I also run a production company called Honey Child, which is dedicated to telling stories by, for, or about Black women 40 plus, who we call honeys. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's the quick and dirty. So really quickly, I want to uh, let everybody know, whenever you're on this platform, you can brag about yourself because we, we love to hear about it. So your film that you're working on, oh no, the film that you already did is on Netflix. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's called Really Love. It was directed by Angel Christie Williams. It stars Kofi Sirabo. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it is a love story about um, two artists. Well, let me back up. It's a love story about an artist who is um, balancing love and art. Um, and that can be a very, very challenging thing when you're on the cusp of like breaking out. Right. And when you're consumed by your your art, consumed by your career, consumed by wanting to um, take it to the next level. And it's based in D.C. Yes, it was a really good film, I might add. I loved it. So, yes, I think if I'm not mistaken, that's where I uh, even uh, first really came across your work uh, as far as your own work, you know, aside from what you were doing for Shonda Rhimes. And uh, I love to say that. 
that good conflict that so many of us as creatives face, especially in a city like LA. Uh, but I think even beyond that, we've seen that in love stories, you know, a, a few times where people have to choose between their love sometimes and their art and or just their, their work, et cetera. And so I think you did a really great job at, at sharing that story. And I'm sure so many people resonated with it. Being that Kofi has been like, you know, someone who's been on a rise these last uh, several years, I was saying that with Queen Sugar, working with Ava, you know, what was it like for you to um, have someone like him attached to your project and believe in your project? Yeah, and I just also want to mention that he stars opposite Yuta Wang Lo Sing, uh, yes. who plays, who's beautiful and striking and talented and amazing. Um, so I wrote him, I used to write in Queen Sugar as well. Um, mm -hmm. but funny enough, uh, Angel and I had Kofi on our list before like <laughs> way back mm -hmm. we saw him in a movie uh, we had him on our list and we saw him in a movie called kicks mm -hmm. um and loved him in that and um and then something with timing didn't work out um but then timing did work out and so mm -hmm. we were able to have him in it and he just blessed us with such an amazing performance and then it's then I got staffed on Queen Sugar, which was great. So we already sort of had that um, connection in terms of being able to write for him. That's beautiful, even how it all just aligned when it was supposed to. Absolutely. Um, That's how in divine timing, divine timing. Yes, definitely. How big of a um, role has that divine time and alignment played in your career, which are different opportunities that you found yourself on? Yeah, I mean, I think one definitely in terms of when really, I mean, really love took 10 years plus to get made. I wrote that script a long time ago when I was living in between DC and Baltimore. Um, but then when it was released, which was released during the pandemic, I think the timing was divine and um, people were able in a position to receive and see it. I thought that was divine. Um, I also think, you know, um, it's interesting when I first came out here, I was still working in film distribution, which was an extension of the work I had been doing before I moved out here. And um, I got laid off <laughs> and it was devastating, but it was also a reminder of why I came out here. It was like, it, it was a moment of needing to recalibrate and get back to the writing. Mm. Um, so that was sort of divine timing in terms of, um, I didn't go too far down that route of being an executive uh, and I was able to refocus on writing again. Uh, so that was great. And I think just like when I even think about getting on Queen Sugar, getting staffed on Queen Sugar, how all the things had to kind of align in order to make that happen. I think getting staffed on any TV show, so many things have to align. Um, so everything happened for the right reason. I even think moving to LA at 35 and not 25 for me worked very well because I was just in a better mental state. I was just had much a different type of experience behind me, a different type of patience, a different type, less fucks to give um so that yes. helped, helped tremendously you know i tell the story often um i plan to move into la and i want to say around 2009 2010 at first i was going to drop out of college to move out here for my first client mm. and seven years later and seven days to the day i moved to la uh after the seven years and seven days to the date of me meeting a client in person for the first time I even just posted them on my as a throwback Thursday the week before I got to LA. And I posted it th Thursday and I got here on that following Wednesday. So wow. seven days later, we had talked in the DMs and everything. I hadn't seen them since we first met the one and only time when I first worked with them in the BNS. And they were the first thing, the first person I encountered, the first person I ran into when I moved to LA. Like wow. literally just come out of Starbucks, I ran into them. And I'm like, what were the chances? And it was just like, it didn't happen when I thought it would. It happened when it was supposed to. And it was just like, that was almost like confirmation. -y. It's like, wow, I ran into the person that I thought I was moving out here for originally, whose career is, you know, unfortunately in a completely different space. So it's like, even if I had, it probably wouldn't have worked out the way it did by me waiting on the time that I was supposed to do it and Absolutely. get my degree and finish in school and be able to, you know, stand on my own. So, I, yeah. I totally agree. Absolutely. Definitely. So, one, I want to I want to go into um, you as a writer, you know, a little bit and, and really break that down. Uh, I read an amazing quote yesterday that said um, it's from a writer friend of mine who's also a client. And she said uh, she posted something that said how 
a writer is nothing but someone who forces the thoughts in their head to pay rent. <laughs> they <laughs> use the thoughts in their head and make the thoughts in their head pay rent. You know, yeah. so you as a writer, you are um, blessed with the opportunity to take your thoughts or your imagination, your creativity, your stories, or the stories of those around you or the people that you know, and you put them into art form in a way that's digestible for the, the general public to take in. You know, um, what has it been like for you to take such experiences and shape, you know, the way people understand life, understand both the good, the bad, the pretty, and the ugly? the stories that you tell in a way that's not biased but like okay but this is a reflection of real life yeah well i would say i don't take thoughts and pay rent <laughs> <laughs> like that is not what i do um but i do think that there it's very challenging work and i say that because the work is hard i think that sometimes writing is one of those things that everybody thinks they can do Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean like it's interesting to me because I don't be like oh I'm gonna go you know perform this surgery I'm gonna go you know write this um this classical music piece I'm gonna go put out this fire you know but a lot of people tend to be like yeah I'm gonna I'm go ahead right mm. it's it's challenging work to do it well yes um, and so but also when you do do it well I think that you are able to sort of access humanity. Like, I think when you do it well, you're able to get to a truth that, mm -hmm. people, that people can feel, you know? And I'm thinking yeah. about writing across the board. I'm thinking about, you know, a Toni Morrison to a, uh, you know, a screenwriter, you know, or a poet or mm -hmm. a, a beautiful songwriter. Like, there's something about being able to access truth. And I think part of, for me, my journey has been doing my own self-work, being able to deal with my feelings and my emotions, being able to sit in them and not run from them, being able to deal with my trauma and understand how trauma impacts and triggers and being, getting closer to my authentic self and then being able to transfer all of that onto the page, right? It's hard to be able to mimic emotion or try to get as close to emotion and truth on the page when you can't even access it in your life, you know? Uh, so a lot of what I have found is that my work tends to open up the more that I am doing the self-work, the more that I'm allowing myself to be vulnerable, the more that I'm allowing myself to feel the feelings and emotions so that when I do write about shame, I know what that feels like. When I do write about rage, you know, I know what that feels like. Can you let the audience know your cash app because you just gave <laughs> us a word right there. So we can just pay our offer right now and let you on your way. Because <laughs> that, that, that was a mouthful in a most amazing way, you know, and you said a lot. And I hope people really take the gems from that, you know, um, seriously. I think the you hit it right on the nail. Like it is something that I think everybody thinks they can do, you know, and to an extent we all can. Right. But you like you said, doing it well and then being able to make people feel the words in that paper, you know, make them feel the emotions that you're you're trying to paint, you know. Um, with that, I think that's one of those things. Even for me, I, I love watching grades. It just, it just feeds me creatively and so much resonates with me. But sometimes I'm like, oh, okay, I got to raise them in the right space to carry grades. And I know I'm going to feel it just like we feel this yeah. is us, you know, because yeah. what, it, what it sparks something real. Your episode, and I'm, I'm excited to break into that. We'll get to that eventually. But your episode is being someone who's African American, being someone who's been in the hospital and seeing how we're treated versus how you know other people are treated uh, firsthand. I grew up in the hood, but then I moved to the suburbs, and I always thought I was the exception. I'm like, well, I got these grades, and I don't look like a thug, and so they won't profile me. And I just thought I was different. And mm -hmm. then you know, life happens, and you realize, okay. I'm not different. And for me, it was in a hospital. Yeah. Ooh. It was like in a hospital where, you know, funny for me, I lived across the street from it, but I was at my grandmother's house. We lived three blocks into the hood. And so I got a completely different experience. And I'm true because I was over there where they thought I was this and they assumed I was that to where the people who came to help me were more so like looking at me like I was an issue or like I, like I was a problem. I'm just like, I'm so confused by this treatment. And it was like a shock for me to experience mm -hmm. that. And I think that's why I resonated so deeply with me. I'm like, wow, people really go through this and their hands are just tied, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, we known episodes by numbers, uh, 1802, mm -hmm. uh, which had a storyline about a young woman, uh, Rashida, 
actually Rashida is one of my bestest besties friends uh besties names so I was able mm -hmm. to put Rashida in there and it was so great to always just hear Rashida all over production meetings and but um <laughs> Uh, Rashida, who needed a, who was basically sort of overlooked for her um, diabetes um, mm -hmm. and uh, basically needed a tra kidney transplant, but had been denied a kidney transplant because of a race qualifier. They call it the EGFR, which basically uses race as a way to determine down. I, I don't want to get into too much of the details. I yeah. also don't mess it up, but like that determines whether or not you um, are in a position for a kidney transplant. And because race was used in it, it was saying that Rashida, a black woman, was not eligible for a kidney. Um, and that is actually a um, real thing in terms of that there are many uh, calculations that are used in medicine that use race unjustifiably. Um, and so there are a lot of people on the ground, doctors, medical students, medical professionals who are trying to change the way that race is used in these calculations because it's impacting um, the health care that is provided to Black people. Um, so Anthony Hill, who plays um, Winston on the show, Dr. Ndugu on the show, um, was part of that storyline and really fought for Rashida and pushed for Rashida's character to um, be added to the transplant list. So again, we just talked about how that is a real thing and art really does imitate life with that storyline. Uh, for you as a writer, what type of responses did you see from women um, in reaction to this episode, in response to this episode? Um, yeah, I mean, it was not just women. It, it Interesting, it was medical professionals too. Um, mm. um, a woman, Dr. Amaka Iniana, I hope I'm not saying her name incorrectly, but she has been at the forefront, one of the doctors at the forefront of trying to change the use of the EGFR. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was so gratifying to be able to speak with her and also amplify the work that she and countless medical professionals are doing. Um, so it's, it's those types of things that I think are really great when, you know, you can use art to amplify activism, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and tell the stories of the work that activists are, act, are doing on the ground every day. That's so beautiful. Uh, it, it brings so much more purpose to what you do artistic, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. How fulfilling is that knowing that, again, this is something that you do because you love to do it, but you are being a voice for so many people who may feel voiceless and oftentimes are voiceless because they don't have the platform that you have to bring light to like something that is very much real to them something that may even be happening to them or somebody they love or not yeah I mean I think it's making sure that we take it very seriously that we do have this uh, large platform like that's the thing about a show like a Grey's Anatomy has a huge platform right so like wanting to be responsible with that platform um is is something that we don't take lightly Definitely. And what has it even been like to be a part of that family, a place where um, diversity matters and diversity has been celebrated and um, not just diversity for us, but for just diversity around the board, you know, yeah. celebrated. Um, and that's culturally, religiously, when it comes to sexuality, so many things, it's, it's been intentionally inclusive there. Um, and it's spearheaded also by a woman who does look like us, a Black woman. So what has it been like for you to be able to not only contribute as a writer there, but as a producer who can bring stories and even, you know, implement something like your friend's name, you know, um, to a space that, is, that welcomes diversity? Yeah, I mean, also in that episode 1802, we introduced uh, Gray's first non-binary character. Uh, played by ER Fat Fightmaster, which was has been amazing to to be a part of that storytelling. Um, but I think also too, it's just realizing. I think you said you hit it like the purpose behind it. You know, I think that Shonda Land has been known and has been pushing the envelope around um, diversity for a very long time. Um, so being able to be a part of that continued push goes is is really gratifying. And also you then want to take that, continue that in your own work. Yes. Um, you know, making sure that you're you're trying to be as inclusive and um, honest and truthful as you can. So how has the work you've done there at Shondaland um, either, I was just say, impacted the work that now you desire to do for yourself, you know, aside from um, the work you contribute there? Well, it's interesting because going into 
going into Grey's Anatomy, I already was very clear on my purpose, um, which mm-hmm. is to tell stories that center Black people, primarily Black women, um, yes. to make sure those stories get to the people, and then to help others do the same. So that's my purpose. So that's kind of what guides my, my personal work. Um, and so I think mainly one of the big things is just the motivation, you know, seeing that, um, you know, when you do sort of stick with it, when you do uh, create quality work, um, things come from that. So I think a lot of the motivation that I've also gotten from being on Grays is sort of the, um, the push to keep going mm-hmm. <laughs> um, in, in the projects that I do outside of it. Taking, you know, the, the um, all you've done already, you know, uh, all you've created personally, again, all you've created um, in other spaces. What stories haven't you told yet that you desire to tell, you know, still, whether that's an actual person that's alive or someone who's passed on, you're like, I want to be the one to write the story and tell the story and make sure it comes to life. Yeah, I mean, so at my uh, production company, Honey Child, we are building a very robust slate. (laughs) We have a lot Mm -hmm. of stories. Um, One story, you know, one sort of bucket is seeing honeys in different environments. And we call our audience Black women 40 and over honey. So we want to see honey face. (laughs) We want to see honeys, you know, in period pieces. We want to see, you know, villain, honeys who are villains. We want to see honeys who are uh, superheroes. We want to see honeys who are bad mothers. We want to see the gamut of honeys, right? But then I also want to see the work of honeys, right? So I want to see if honeys have a a YA dystopian pilot. I want to see that. If honeys have a a film about, you know, um, their experience being a transgender woman, I want to see that. Like, so there's a gamut of things. For me, I guess the next step is all the things I can't write. Right, because I do have a limited perspective. We all do. I have limited experience um, in terms of life experience and limited imagination, um, and not the right person to write everything. So for me, I'm I'm excited about being able to be in position to help other honeys um, tell their stories as well. Please surprise everybody. <laughs> You are dropping so many gems. I don't even know if you know, because you're really just talking and just like sharing things. And it's just like, even that to say, um, my experience is limited. Like that's such a simple confession, but at the same time, that's so important to know because there are people who take off and buy off way more than they can handle, more than they can do. So they can be able to say, buy me and buy me. And I did this and I did that. When it's like, well, the quality may go down every time you have to do this, 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 and that. And you weren't able to really control quality because you were so stretched trying to do it all. So understand that, you know what, I have a limit to what I can do because I am human. However, I can position other people and create, you know, um, paths for them and create doorways for them. I think that's so beautiful. And that alone uh, is what's going to, I think, prepare you even further, you know, because of your your heart to to make sure this is taken care of. And I think even beyond that, you also just spoke about just the uh, importance of, I guess, understanding like your your connection, your your connection to it being honest and real because it's your experience versus like, oh, well, that person is, that's their experience. So let them tell it the way they need to, you know, and I can just be a resource. So I love that, you know, so I much. Know, I think more of us just need to get out of the way. <laughs> you know Please I mean? say that again. I don't think they all heard you. More of us need to do what? Get out of the way, you know, yes. um, and decenter ourselves. Um, even, even those of us who are, you know, oppressed by one group, there's usually people who are even more oppressed and we don't need to, um, always be in the center of everything. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting out of the way and trying to help other honeys, um, tell amazing stories. I love that. So I want to just go back a little bit because I, I jumped into this way before I even planned to, the, to the Grey's Anatomy part. I wanted to build up there because that was like my exciting part. So I feel like I want to just go back to the beginning. What made you even decide to get into writing, writing scripts and, and wanting to tell stories? Like, is there something from your childhood that made you say, you know what, I, I love writing, I love, you know, journaling. Like, where did it start for you? I mean, honestly, you know, I... I... I was talking about this the other day, you know, my start in terms of my love for storytelling, I didn't know it then, but I know it now came through hip hop because Mm. I always tell people before I knew James Baldwin, I knew Big Daddy Kane, right? Like I didn't, I didn't know James Baldwin to high school. And that was me being in the library and just like 
with, with black books, you know? Um, and so I was very enthralled growing up by the ability to tell a story in a short span of time, a short, a concise story that a lot of MCs are able to do. Um, so I would write down the lyrics in, in a notebook and all of that. And so then I went to school, I went to um, undergrad and studied business because it's not like you could get a job. I had no plan. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I had a professor though who saw something in my writing and she encouraged me to um, minor in English. And I was like, mm, that sounds like more time and more money. And also I don't know any writers. This, it wasn't clicking in my head that you could be a professional writer. So I got a degree in business and marketing which serves me to this day. But um, after that, I found myself bored in my corporate marketing job. So I found an internship with a black owned community newspaper out of Staten Island. I was living in Jersey at the time and he would publish our work. Um, mm -hmm. So my first published piece ever was a review of uh, Mary J. Blige's No More Drama album almost 20 years ago. Wow. And I don't, I didn't know music criticism, but I was like, I know Mary. So I wrote this piece <laughs> and it got published. And so when I saw my byline, I was like, oh, it like was a big moment for me because I felt like I was part of something bigger than myself. And like I was in conversation with something bigger than myself. And so I started out my writing career as a freelance mm -hmm. entertainment journalist, writing about music. Um, and then um, I expanded to writing about books. I was I always loved books. Um, and so that took me to going back to school and getting my degree basically in creative writing and publishing mm -hmm. at Emerson. Um, and then I did the New York book publishing thing. I worked in book publishing and that transitioned into writing my own books. So I wrote six books, one of which is a book about hip hop called mm -hmm. The Message. Um, and then books became really hard and I stopped writing for about seven years and it was the biggest mm -hmm. mistake I've ever made in my life. And it was um, that time, once I picked up writing again, that I was, I was like, I need to find, I want a new form. Books wasn't my form. Um, so I started writing what became really love and then I moved to LA. Felicia, what are you doing today? Like you are about to make me cry several times on this call. Like you are speaking to my life. You don't understand. <laughs> Uh, I started off as an entertainment journalist mm. at a team magazine in high school. Literally just as a way to make money. And I'm like, I graduated early and I had nothing to do. So I'm like, well, why not? You know, so yeah. I got to interview people like Obama and, and right. Usher and all these people. Like, yeah. well, everybody's in school. And then that transitioned into PR, which then transitioned into, you know, writing more music and doing now scripts and stuff. So it's just... Nice. So much alignment here. So I'm like, I'm, I'm I, taking a lot I, personally. I love it. I do a Zoom. I mean, now it's like once a year, but I just did a Zoom for Black journalists looking to transition into film and TV. Um, I need to know so about many, that. Yeah, there's so many transferable skills and I talk about that. So you came from journalism um, and just, again, storytelling, period. And I think when you're a writer, it's just a part of you that's like, storytelling is just really the center of, of what that is at, at the end of the day, right? Like you're yeah. ultimately telling the story, whether it's through poetry or music or a script, you're telling the story. Yeah. So for those who are currently, they're like, okay, I just had this gift and I can tell a story. I just know how to write, but they don't necessarily know how to get into being an author or how to get into writing scripts for TV or film. You know, what advice would you give them to help them get their start and to start figuring out once everything from form and format to understanding how to get their stuff distributed or get their stuff in front of the right people or to even develop it themselves. Like, you know, what advice would you have for those writers? Yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about how I did it. One, you know, so when I was writing what became really love, as I was, I was essentially self-teaching myself, right? But what I had going for me and what I had been cultivating at that point for over 10 years was voice. So I mm. think that a lot of times if you are already writing, but you may not be writing in the form you want to transition into, one thing that you probably have going for you is voice. And so I think it's really important for us to continue to cultivate our voice. Although I don't, I, I don't necessarily have the answer on how to do that. I know that my voice is a mix of my mother and my father, East Baltimore, mm. West Baltimore, um, and growing up partly in Jersey, growing up in Baltimore County, loving hip hop, like my voice is, is a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also inspiration, you know, loving James Baldwin, loving Toni Morrison, loving, so a lot of inspiration. So, but I would just say cultivate, and for me, that's then living a very bold and colorful and cultural life. 
Because I think that's the thing sometimes that like people forget to do is live. Um, and then you see it in their work, right? It, it, it's not as colorful as it can be. It's not as bold as it can be. It's not as honest. It's not as vulnerable. Um, so living goes a long way, as does actually writing, right? Even if you don't completely know what you're doing, um, getting it down on page and developing a creative practice. Uh, that to me is really, really important because that is going to be, for me, it's the foundation of my career is my creative practice, right? And part of my creative practice includes self, includes the self-work. So for me, my self-work is therapy, it's meditation, it's yoga, it's hiking with my homegirl, it's living a bold life, right? It's being in my emotions, not running from all that self-work. Um, so it's, that's part of my creative practice. I don't divorce the two. But then also as part of the creative practice, some sort of discipline, right? Coming up with a writing schedule so that you can actually finish it <laughs> and having accountability so for me it's writers groups I was in I started started with two writers groups I'm still in two writers groups I also take a bunch of classes I took a bunch of writing classes tv writing classes right now I'm taking a bunch of directing classes so always being for me a space of learning um intellectual rigor and accountability right um and then Part of that too is networking, building your one, your village, that's the people you can hold, hold you down. And then your larger network of people who could possibly think about you for opportunities. Um, so those I say are like the important things to be, to be doing. And then when you are ready, when you have your portfolio of work, your samples, particularly for film and TV, that's when you start to, you, you know, activate your network um, to get opportunities, but you have to be ready. Definitely. And even with that, you know, for we all want the mentors and the people that can sit here and be like, oh, yeah, that give me my stamp of approval, right? But sometimes the honest truth is we're really not ready. And I think, you know, um, we live in a, in a society now where council culture is such a thing that if you don't accept something, then it's like, oh, you're hated. Mm -hmm. And people don't know how to accept necessarily criticism anymore. Uh, so how do you, as somebody who is established, who does have experience, how do you graciously tell somebody like, okay, well, no, you, you're not ready yet. Like, oh, right? I, tell, I, I tell them graciously, don't send it to me till it's ready. Mm. Because I tell them, use me for opportunities. Don't use me for feedback. Mm. So find other people you can get your feedback from even if that's like a professional reader that you pay like I would I would pay a professional reader to read my work I'd work it with my writers groups have peers and that sort of thing then when it's ready I go to so I tell people don't use me for feedback use me for opportunities so when you're ready I read you and I think about you for opportunities I'm not reading you for feedback mm. Alicia this was for me this <laughs> 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 the more you talk, I'm like, this, this episode was for me. I'm the people today. Like, I'm the people who needed to hear this. So thank you. But I would Seriously. say getting used to, um, I mean, you know, uh, constructive criticism builds our work, right? Like it, it helps to make it better. So I do think it's important for us to be able to receive feedback. That doesn't mean we always have to like it. Sometimes I get off the phone on notes call. I'm like, fuck that. But then I know it's going to make it better. It's just me, again, sitting in my emotions, knowing that those two will pass. So, but I do think that the ability to take notes and think about notes thoughtfully and really think about how to make something better and continuously be committed to making something better is important. I want to ask you this, how um, impactful has your um, mental health journey been to your work? Like even you talking about taking therapy, I'm sure something like, okay, well, I got these notes today and like those type of things may come up in therapy conversations. So how has your therapist and your journey with your mental health, uh, your mental health helped or impacted your journey uh, with your uh, writing and even your ability to receive uh, notes and changes and um, just all that comes with the job that some of the things that we may not like about the job sometimes of being a creator. Yeah, I mean, and also this Hollywood is fucking toxic. Like, yeah. It is toxic and triggering. Um, so my like my therapist has been is on my team. You know, when you think about who's on your team, I include my therapist because she helps me to maintain a certain level of grounding um, and self-awareness and tools to deal with fuckery. 
Um, and she helps me also on my growth process, right? So my, I, you know, I talked about all kinds of things, like things that happen in the business, but also triggers. So I understand why I'm feeling a certain kind of way or understanding why I'm reacting a certain kind of way. And that has opened up my work tremendously, but also has opened up how I move in the world. Mm -hmm. And part of, I think, being a writer, particularly in Hollywood, is, you know, a piece about self-assuredness and confidence, um, because people will sniff des des desperation and they will take advantage of you, right? Um, and even when you are desperate, <laughs> you will make bad decisions. So for me, I came like to 2017, I was in a season of low worth. Mm. Um, and so I had to work with my therapist. And because of that, I was taken advantage of some bullshit went down. So I had to work with my therapist to get tools up in order to deal with that. And also to make sure that I was walking in my power and in my full worth. And that is a very hard place to get to. I wouldn't even say I'm hundred percent there, but I'm pretty damn close. <laughs> um, so that, that helps me maneuver and show up as the best and most authentic Felicia that I can be. Um, which helps with the storytelling um, and it helps with, you know, connecting with people, all of that. I think a lot of people think they can't afford therapy. And I'm like, a lot of times we can't afford to live without it. I mean, we yeah. can, but it changes the, the, the quality of our lives. Well, the one thing I will say, I mean, you know, California in particular, I know everyone's all over the place in terms of where they live, but California has really great social services. Um, mm -hmm. So finding, so using social services to get therapy is a really great thing to do. Um, yeah. I wanna... Therapy doesn't work for everyone. I think it's mm -hmm. about finding what works for you, but being yeah to to um meet tending to your mental health uh i want to jump back into the honeys really quickly you know um you talked about moving to la at 35 you know and again you said you could have done it at 25 but you was in a better space at 35 and i think we've seen over and over again from people like even samuel jackson like everybody don't start as a child actress or a child actor some people do start later what where is the advice do you have for people who have for some reason accepted the fact that it's too late? I feel like it's never too late. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just feel that way. And I also feel like what are ways that you can see your age as an asset? Even if other motherfuckers don't see it, how can you see it? Because you'll move in that way, right? Um, I turned 39 in my first writer's room. I was a staff writer at 39 and I saw my age as an asset. I saw that I was of an age that was close to our characters is when I was in, on Queen Sugar that was close to a couple of our main characters ages. I saw that I had a lot of experience, life experience and career experience that I could share in the room that could, um, you know, help inform storytelling. I felt that I had a maturity that um, also helped in the room. Like I, I looked at my age as an asset. Um, and also I, I just came with a lot. We have a lot more contacts. We know a lot more, like it's, it's, I, I, how can you think about your age as an asset versus how Hollywood thinks about age? Hollywood tends to not think, uh, very, um, I just would not trust Hollywood's lead on how they think about most things, <laughs> age, diversity. Like I would not take their lead at all, at all. Um, so that's what I would say. How, I'll ask it like this. How have you learned to be in the system and not of the system or in Hollywood and not of Hollywood um, and still be in balance with it. Like I love early what you just said even a couple of minutes ago. You said sometimes you'll be the one in the desperate position that'll make, you know, bad decisions, you know? But does that yeah. necessarily make you a bad person? No, it's part of, you know, having to survive. Survival is having to do what you have to do to protect yourselves, you know? Uh, not to make it this extreme, but if you think about an animal in a wild, one animal has to eat another to live. Does it make it a malicious being or that's just the nature of the beast? right that's the circle yeah. of life so for you you know how how do you handle that you know in the industry being a being in this industry but not being of it and being well, different well I mean I'm glad that I didn't grow up in the industry um you know uh for myself knowing myself but also I'm very clear that the that Hollywood is not my source and when you know that Hollywood is not your source you think differently um, you don't necessarily have to be in a perpetual state of fear, fear to lose your job, fear to this, fear to that. This is not my source. Also, I'm very clear that my purpose is bigger than Hollywood. I would be a storyteller if Hollywood did not exist. 
Um, so those things help to keep me focused and keep me grounded. And also I just come from, I, I am the daughter of Felix and Annie. They don't fuck around. You know what I mean? So that's also part of it. <laughs> like I just was raised, um, on certain values that I've been able to maintain, um, that helps tremendously. And also I know that I have a God given talent that cannot be taken away from me. It just can't. You can take a lot of things away, credit, money, things like that, but you cannot take this talent and you cannot take this work. Leave the people your cash out. This is my third time asking as you're <laughs> preaching today. <laughs> you know, I want to jump into that. You were talking about the confidence and, um, you know, that being a thing. A lot of times we're afraid to speak up because we think it's going to make us look bad, right? And yeah. honestly, to an extent, you know, uh, one that, could argue that's that. real, though. That's yeah. real. Yeah. But at the same time, you've also seen so many times when people have spoken up and it's changed, even if, they, if it comes with backlash, the level of respect changes. You know, uh, oh, people completely, they, they, they don't mind the push over because like, great, I can get my way. But yeah. you respect the person who stands their ground, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, so how has you, and especially as an African-American woman, a Black woman, you know, a woman of color, um, there's already a stigma that comes attached to you anyway, right? Yes. So how do you stand your ground and be like, okay, well, hey, I hear you and I respect you, but this is where I stand. And no disrespect to anybody else, but this is where I stand, you know? Um, how do you get to that space? And when did you get to that place? I know that's not something that we all just come out the womb knowing. I think we, we go from having that childlike faith to then that's broken down some, and then we have to find that again. So, you know, how do you deal with it? And when did you find that? Well, I do think that's something that has been um, part of me because, again, of Felix and Annie. Mm -hmm. of, um, they really instilled in different ways certain things we just don't put up with. Um, and having a pride in who we are and what we stand for. So that has always been there. I think though that um, sort of what has, has grown is just, just not having the fear and realizing that people are gonna attach that stigma no matter what you do. <laughs> like I was on another Zoom and they were out, someone asked me about like, you know, pe people want people of color to write a certain kind of thing, but will that box you in? And when I'm like, write whatever you want, because they're going to box you in no matter what. <laughs> like, and yeah. so racism is going to continue to racism. Like, there's no way to get around it. You can try to contort yourself. You can try to dress differently, sound differently, look differently, choose differently. It doesn't fucking matter, right? So if it doesn't matter, I might as well lead with my values. I might as well lead with my authenticity. I might as well lead with what makes me comfortable. Because a lot of times for me, picking and choosing my battles is about maintaining my joy. It don't have nothing to do with, with them. It don't have nothing mm -hmm. to do with sort of the, the sort of politics that I'm navigating. I'm just like, mm, do I want to disrupt my joy today? And sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> so that's how I make decisions sometimes. Yeah. Based on that. Um, but then other times it's really like, I think about legacy. I think about my name, my parents' name, my family name is going to be on this. I think about you know, my people and wanting to make sure that I'm doing my, all I can to make sure that they're represented in the way that I know them to be, which is fully mm -hmm. realized, you know, complicated, complex. Yeah. Oh, so those sorts of things you definitely feel, you yeah. know, you definitely feel those things. Definitely. You know, I want to bring this to a close because I feel like you've already shared so much. But, um, you know, before um, I do, I just want to ask this for, um, just creatives in general who have had the last few years to, you know, sit and do whatever they feel they needed to do. I know in the beginning, a lot of people feel pressures on like what you should be doing with this time. And I think this time is different for everybody. I read another amazing book the other day that talked about productivity. It's not always being on the move. It's also knowing when to rest, knowing when to work, when to be still, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so for creatives who have been 
you know, locked down as we've all been for these last few years, but they're ready to use their voice now. But they're still conditioned to the system that was in place before, whether that was the system of how society works and with work and, and employment, or just like, okay, well, this is a hierarchy, this is how this goes. You know, how, how do you encourage them to challenge what was the norm before and adapt to what is now and to really follow their creative hearts? I mean, I think that's the last part, right, is to follow your creative heart. Um, it's interesting how many people, like even with Really Love early on, even, this was before I even met um, Angel Christie Williams, the director, how many people said no and how many people said they saw a movie like this. And I was like, with Black people in it? <laughs> and it would be crickets, you know, like there are no rules, they like to act like there are, they act to, like to act like, and I'm talking when I say they, systems, mm -hmm. they like to act like um, there has to be one way to do something and it's not, there isn't. And that tends to be when, um, you know, black people have been able to make things out of nothing forever. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then it becomes a trend and then it becomes this, it becomes a global phenomenon. It becomes a cultural movement. You know, I think we do have to follow our hearts. I think that we have to use what's in our hand. I think that we have to make our shit. I think that we have to collaborate with each other. I think we have to own our content. I think we have to create tables and systems outside of the major system. I think if we do work in the system, we have to make it work for us. I think we can, I think there's many things for us to be doing. And while we're living boldly, you know, rest is part of my creative practice as is pleasure. Pleasure is part of my creative practice, right? So being able to um, continue to live very full lives so that we can tell very full stories with or without Hollywood. I don't have any more words. <laughs> what an ending. Like, what a way to bring it to a close. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. As always, you can like, share, comment, subscribe, rate, do all of those things. We would love to hear from you and to hear your feedback. Go ahead and join us on Instagram at The Entourage Podcast, as well as like our Facebook page, The Entourage Podcast. Also, visit our website, theentouragepodcast.com. Sign up to get our emails, and we will see you all next time under the spotlight.